The following is a hoop ball presentation. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. Welcome to October, friends, the month where NBA begins. I think other stuff happens in October. Oh, Halloween is this month. My kid is very excited about that. Didn't do it last year. Hey, what's happening? Welcome to Fantasy NBA Today, a hoop ball presentation. I'm your host, Dan Bespris. And by popular demand, I'm changing the way we do shows here in the short term because a lot of these episodes are going to have guest hits. Today's does. We'll be talking to the great Aaron Bruski momentarily. You guys are like, hey, it takes too long to get ramped up. So what I'm doing now is this is the idea. First, I'm going to tell you guys to follow me on Twitter at Dan Bespris, D-A-N-B-E-S-B-R-I-S, or just Google Dan from Hoopball. I'm doing a ton on social media this year. Slightly more in-depth stuff. We can chat it out. I'm taking more questions this year. Uh, a lot of good reasons to do that. This is, of course, a hoop ball presentation. This podcast is hoop-ball.com at hoopball fantasy, the website. Please do go get yourself a hoop ball fantasy pass for just $5.99 a month. It powers the locomotive. I want to start shows within the first minute and 30 seconds by doing a quick hit on something fantasy related. And then we'll sort of pivot back into whatever our kind of uh, get ready for the show, get ready for the next couple of episodes thing. So today, because there wasn't any massive breaking news in the NBA over the last uh, 24 hours or so, nothing earth-shattering at the very least, I wanted to do something that I'm going to continue on Twitter, which is I want to talk you guys out of or into particular players. And it's not really a segment. I don't really have a name for it. Nothing cute comes to mind. But it's all about the hype train. So at the beginning of episodes here, I want to talk you guys out of a particular hype train player. And there are enough of them uh, that we can probably do one almost every show <laughs> for like the next two weeks. So today, and by the way, I need to, when we get into it, I'll explain myself. Today we're going to talk about Hype train guy, and this is in no particular order. This is just an order as I was perusing names that I was watching fly up the draft board. We're going to talk about OG Ananobi. First, I want to remind you guys what a hype train player is. Someone on the hype train is not just a guy who has a lot of buzz. Because I, I asked a question a couple nights back, hey, what's a hype train guy you guys want me to talk about? And I got a lot, a lot of like Luca Giannis. Like those guys are not hype train guys. Those are just superstars. And sometimes superstars get overvalued in fantasy because of things they do, ignoring things they don't. Hype train guys are those who start as relative values for a coming season, and that gets wiped away through what basically becomes a snowball effect also known as a positive feedback loop, or in this case, kind of negative feedback loop for our value purposes. So, for example, Shea Gilgis-Alexander, I think, is a perfect example of that from last year. When draft season opened last year, and mind you, the whole thing was jammed into about six and a half weeks because we didn't even know where free agency was going until the beginning of November, and the season started six weeks after that. So it was a little bit weird, but at the beginning of November, Shea was going at like 45 in fantasy drafts, to 50. And within 10 days, he was going at 35. And seven days after that, it was 30. And seven days after that, it was 25. And all of a sudden, by the time most of us were drafting relatively late to the season, I like to draft late because it avoids any of the injury stuff, he was going near 20. He was an end-of-second-round guy last year. We all loved Shea. Six weeks earlier. The problem is that it's very hard to let go of something when it seems so good. I rack my brain trying to think about a real-world analogy that I could compare this to, and I couldn't come up with anything really apt. So I just need you guys to really strap on your thinking caps with me here and think about something that you'd been 
relying on for a while. You could think even longer than in this case, Shay, when you're like, oh, sweet, you know, value, here comes the value, and then it gets taken away from you. Whatever it might be. I guess maybe an easy one would be like you have a trip planned, and at the last second, something comes up and you can't go. Flights are grounded, in a pandemic, I guess that's not that insane, or something happens that's not horrendous in your personal life, so perspective-wise, you can still feel bad about not... So you have to cancel your trip at the last second, and you're not going to get to go on it. That was your one chance to do it. It's really upsetting to have that thing that you were that you were planning on, that you were really excited about taken away from you. A lot of us in that moment would think, well, maybe I can just do it anyway. Whatever the thing is that's trying to keep you at home. I don't know what it is. So, I mean, this, this metaphor, this comparison is going to go off the rails here. That's basically what's happening with hype train guys. You become so attached to them because of how great they look in that flickering moment that even once it's no longer a good idea, you still want to do it. Maybe a better comparison on this trip thing would be you're planning on going on a trip and uh, it's six weeks away and every week you get closer to going on the trip, you find out another terrible thing that's happening at the destination. And yet you're still just like, eh, I think I'll probably do it anyway. There's no real life place that I'm going to use in this example because that will end up, (laughs) that's an offensive thing to pick. Like, you're going to, where have I been? Like, I'm not going to pick a place I've been that didn't turn out to be very much fun. You're, You're going to any place and like six weeks before, you find out there's a wildfire. And four weeks before you're going, you find out there's flash flooding. And three weeks before you go, you find out that there's a 20% chance you land at the airport and a house cat mauls your face. And every time you hear these ridiculous things, you're, you keep thinking, I should just do it anyway. This was going to be a great trip. It's still, I can still make this work. That's the hype train. You can't get off of it because you get so attached to the idea of a thing that you forget there's, there's a whole set of reasonings that went into it. Maybe that was enough for today. Well, I do still want to talk about OG Ananobi. So let's use an example from this year. Remember, when we went into the offseason in May, I said to you guys, OG Ananobi is a player to watch next year. We were super excited about it. Because he has a fantasy stat set that tends to fly under the radar, which is efficiency, defensive stats, three-pointers, not a ton of rebounds or assists, not a ton of scoring, relatively low turnovers. That's not a guy that usually gets a lot of hype. So we all thought, great, Kyle Lowry's gone. His role is going to increase. Everything arrows pointed up. Well, guess what? Everybody caught on. He was number 35 on a per-game basis last year. And I thought, well, he'll probably go one to two rounds back of that this season because he's just not that sexy. It's kind of the Mikhail Bridges phenomenon, who was 42 last year per game, played in all 72 ballgames, and he's still, Bridges is still going 50 to 60 range. Because he has a quiet fantasy game, those guys tend to go one to two rounds back of where they end up. That's just what happens. But then... Three weeks ago, four weeks ago, when we started analyzing drafts and pre-ranks, there was OG going inside the top 50. I thought, oh boy, he's only like a round back of where he was last year. And then we did some mock drafts two weeks after that, and he was going in the 40s. And then we looked at drafts a week or two after that, which is bringing us to basically where we are now, and he's going like around 40. His ADP on Yahoo is in the 50s. So it doesn't totally add up, except that Yahoo's projections keep pushing forward. They have him projected as number 44 this coming year. Analysts are very bullish on OG for good reason. He was going to have a really big season. And so all of that just keeps pushing I do. I, I used the uh, name that tune analogy on this podcast earlier in the week, I think, and that's probably not good enough because it's not, it, that doesn't perfectly describe the phenomenon that's going on. It's not so much that we see him going at 40 and we decide we need to go at 38 to stay ahead of the curve. It's more how does 
it's kind of a three-step process, I guess. So he's going at 50. Uh, Yahoo puts out a projection of 40-something. Someone drafts him closer to the projection. His ADP slides up to 44. An analyst says, I've got him at 35. Yahoo adjusts their projection up to 40. He starts moving towards 40. So it's really about analyst, big box site reacting, ADP reacting. Analyst, big box, ADP. And it creates that kind of feedback loop where rather than just people in the draft going, I got to beat this guy to a player, it's that over each week, the number gets driven earlier. Big box site adjusts a player earlier so that they look closer to accurate. And then he ends up getting drafted earlier. So OG now, who, again, I know his ADP claims that it's still in the 50s, but it's not. His pre-rank is 44. He's getting drafted close to that. Have we wiped out the value all the way yet? The answer right now is still no, but it's also still 18 days from the start of the NBA season. Ananobi is likely to have a per-game value this year in the 30s. Again, does he miss 12, 13, 14 games? Probably. Raptors play their guys a ton of minutes. Dudes get hurt, nicked up, bruises, bumps, whatever. They they take a game or two off here and there. He'll probably do that three or four times during the year. If there's any real injury, knock out another two weeks. So now you're looking about 13 missed ball games. So slightly sub-average in that. So mid-30s on a per-game basis probably puts him in the 40s by totals, which is now where he's going. How does he move in front of that barricade? Free throw percent gets a little bit better, although he doesn't take many, so that's not a huge deal. Or usage goes up a little bit more. He took 12 shots a game last year. You could certainly see him in a post-Kyle Lowry scenario, getting that up to 12 and a half. I doubt we see him go higher than 13 shots a game. It just doesn't really feel like that's his bread and butter. He's not the offensive guy on that Raptors team. It's not like Lowry left and nothing else slotted in. They have all these other guys that are perfectly happy to take extra shots, probably more aggressively so than does OG. So much as I, as we all analysts and, and here on Fantasy NBA Today, much as we talked about him back in May and, and June as a guy likely to be a tra- uh, just a spectacular value, we have to learn to let that go as he now starts getting drafted in the 40s, sometimes low 40s, sometimes even late 30s, fourth rounder, instead of where we needed him to be going, which was mid-fifth. It's all about the idea of where does the value point dissipate? Where can you no longer draft a guy and expect him to exceed that by enough? Or rather, other guys getting drafted in that same area, can they exceed their draft position by more? And I think the answer to that question is a resounding yes. There are other guys on the board, and you know we could go to, we could go to our draft results from the mock we've been breaking down. He went in that mock at 38. That's really early. Now, to, to that team's credit, he was not going to get back some 20-odd picks later. So it was do that there or wait. But just looking right behind him, Tobias Harris was still on the board, 20s per game basis last year, always durable. Clint Capella, 20s per game, not super durable, but survived. And I think similar games played outlook as OG. That Chris Middleton still floating around. John Collins still floating around. Maybe a little more upside there with, with Ananobi. Porzingis always hurt, but again, top 20 per game type of guy. And this is a roto draft. So, you know, Porzingis does work in himself into the equation there. Miles Turner, is that a guy you look at? If he stays healthy, he just blows all these dudes out of the water, but... Doesn't really stay all that healthy. So, point is, if OG's going at 40 instead of 55, you've wiped out the ceiling, barring an extraordinarily healthy year, which is kind of the caveat on a lot of these guys. If they play 82 ball games, almost anybody that plays every single game is going to beat their ADP. That's just the fact. Like, if somebody is super duper healthy, even if their per game stinks, they probably beat their ADP. And that's more useful with some guys than others. If OG is going top 40 
per game and is super healthy, that's obviously extraordinarily useful. I just don't think you can game plan for that based on what we've seen from all Raptors pretty much the last couple of years. No one on that team stays healthy the whole season. Susan, it's so great to finally be able to get together again. Oh, it sure is. And I really appreciate you picking up the bill. I'm happy to. I've got the extra cash. Since we've all been driving so much more again, I've been using GetUpside, the free gas app that pays you cash back for every gallon of gas you buy. Wait a minute. Are you saying you actually get paid cash when you buy gas with the GetUpside app? Yes, up to 25 cents a gallon. Cash back every time I buy gas. Does that actually add up to anything? Some months I make 200 to 300 bucks. Wow, that's serious extra cash. I'm downloading the free GetUpside app now. Download the free GetUpside app now in the App Store or Google Play to save up to 25 cents a gallon when you buy gas. Use promo code FILL for a 25 cents a gallon bonus on your first tank. That's up to 50 cents a gallon on your next fill-up. You can cash out anytime to PayPal or an e-gift card for Amazon and other brands. Just download the free GetUpside app and use promo code FILL for a 25 cents a gallon bonus on your first tank. That's code FILL. Reminder, friends, if you want to get in a hoop ball league, we're in last call territory now. Drafts start eight days from today, so we have gone to waitlist mode. Every time we hit 12 people on a waitlist for a particular league type, we will open up a new one, so it's not like you need someone to drop out to get in, but we're not opening the new leagues until they hit 12 people ready to jump in simultaneously. So please do reach out now. If you wait, you probably won't get into a 12-pack of humans, presumably, or very sophisticated chimpanzees that want to join these fantasy leagues. Hit me up on Twitter at Dan Bespris or email teamhoopball at hoop-ball.com to join a hoopball league today. We have head-to-head, roto, cash, and free daily and weekly formats. We'll get you situated. Also, please do rate and subscribe to the podcast. That's ex- extremely important, actually. The subscription button means everything to me this time of year. And also, if you'd like to join the ranks of us here, on the uh, expert side at HoopBall. Think you got what it takes to write for fantasy or DFS? Same deal. Hit me up on Twitter at Dan Bespers or email teamhoopball at hoop-ball.com. Big dog time, ladies and gentlemen. It's Friday. It must be big dog time. I open my ears. I hear... Arf, arf. Yeah. And luckily, you and I have known each other now long enough to where uh, I can pretty much say anything and just like let it dangle and you know to bark afterwards. <laughs> That's really what a weird dynamic. Good day to you, sir. Good day. Good and, day. Uh, yeah. No, it's it, we, we just you know it's seamless around here. We're just you know going twenty four seven, and we were just talking about like five other things, and then we just started recording. Yeah, because uh, you you suddenly you were like, oh, by the way, I got to go in twenty nine minutes. And I went, oh, let's do this thing. Hey, happy Brewski one fifty week, buddy. You got it done. Yeah, I am so thrilled, man. And um, I don't know who has time to read my little preambles before. You know, the B-150. But I did. Like this, I read it. Did, oh, good. Yeah. Thank you. You know, it's funny in this industry. Nobody reads the, the, each other's stuff. Nobody listens to each other's stuff. No, we're all too damn busy working on our That's own the, next thing. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody. I mean, like, it could be like Adrian Wojnarowski and, you know, like, hey, did you read my stuff? No. That's all the tweet. <laughs> yeah. That's Everybody good. else talked about it. No, it's... um. It's This one feels the best out of them all. I've had more fun with this one. Um, You know, just the kind of the when you accomplish things like and and for those who haven't read the preamble haven't got the brewski 150 yet basically there could have been a chance that it didn't happen i don't think it ever crossed my mind that it couldn't happen um this medical stuff i'm dealing with i like couldn't hold a pen i can't sit or stand or breathe or that was the case like six months ago without like massive crippling pain um and so i've had to like and i've been through a couple surgeries and you know um recovered from those and then still continue to do work. Um, but like <laughs> there was times I was like, I don't know how the hell I'm going to tap into a keyboard. Well, you weren't sleeping how... either in there. No, I had the two carpal tunnel surgeries as re- uh, recommended by my doctors. They ended up being not really relevant. Um, but they were kind of desperate measures for desperate times. Um, luckily I got plugged into two sports, uh, trainers here in Sacramento for the pro teams. Um, and they, pretty much fixed me up man like so what you're saying is people should get the brewski 150 
Yeah, I think in a roundabout way, that's what I'm saying. Um, no, <laughs> I just, but, I'm but here just to put no, the train. No joke. It was like, I had to like figure, and, and what was so cool about it is there was about five things I, I put on my list of, from a couple of years back, you know, it's like, I'd love if I had time to really do that. And, you know, these are more like data-based manipulations and really getting in and like, I feel like I've gotten to the point where there might be some diminishing returns on the specificity of how I'm able to predict outcomes. How? Wait, tell me more. Um, what, what, whatever that you like, can that people might understand without like giving away the entire sausage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I just think that like now it's to the point where I, I almost feel like I, I can't miss on, on certain projection or projections, predictions. They're going to be within the range of outcomes that I understand. And that, makes so much so much easier on on because there's there's like this data side of everything but then there's this basketball side of everything and i just feel like you know for whatever reason my my life path i've been able to connect with basketball play basketball watch a ton of basketball um i mm -hmm. feel like i can watch film and understand a player within about five seconds what they're gonna be you know long term short term you name it so like that's the side that takes time. That's the side that takes sort of, sort of like vision and, you know, this like, you got to like play it out in your head. Like what is actually going to happen with all these people when the, you know, the bullets start flying in the middle of the season. And then you've got like, and I think some of that comes back to blurb writing. And I know that you guys are sending out tweets for recruits for blurb writing. Yep. Come on, come all hit me up. Maybe not all come. Well, be most. Yeah. Not all. <laughs> Well, you got to be able to you gotta be able to spell your name, right? Yeah, you got to be got to be able to put a sentence or two together. So maybe not all, but and most probably a really good sentence that makes a lot of sense and adds value. Yeah, that that one, that type of sentence. Hey, I had someone uh, ask me. Sorry, I know this is off topic, and then I wanted I want more on the B one hundred and fifty, and this is actually on it. Um, first of all, we're talking about the Brewski one hundred and fifty, which for those that are relatively new, this is hoop balls list. This is our rank board that you, Aaron Brewski, have put together. Every year since Hoop Balls existed, it has been crushing the competition, and it really hasn't been close. I had someone ask me today if you handicap games played, and I said, of course, it's a projection, but how do you do some of that stuff, too? Can you work that into your answer to my other question? Yeah, well, um, that one is... that. Yeah, hmm. They're very similar questions. Yeah. I'll try. Um, so, like, as a blurb writer... You know, over the years, you know, and I was writing blurbs and we're going to get to talk to Dr. A at some point and, and I'm just like waiting. That's like the biggest item on my calendar because um, me and Doc, I mean, we were in the trenches for years together. We were using AI or, uh, AOL instant messenger. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Did you ever install the dead aim plugin that would save all the stuff and add all the like the first uh, little animated gifts that you could use in those? That was that was the best. No, no, we were nowhere near that sophisticated. Like, <laughs> this we is like 2001, on. the pride um, of 1999 through 2002 or whatever it was. Oh, yeah. See, I was I was after that. And um, the we were just I mean, I think they had been using these for a year for years, but RSS feed feed readers. So like article writers, in fact, um, Sherwood Strauss, Ethan Sherwood Strauss. Uh, just wrote an article in his new thingy mabopper that he's doing um, <laughs> post athletic. I love a good he, thingy mabopper. Well, he he started kind of the same time I did. We both had like 500 followers at the same time, and we were Warriors guys. And and, and we don't know each other at all, so I don't know, like a friend of mine or anything. But like he wrote this article that described what it was like when we started, and it was RSS readers. Like in the fantasy side, not what he was talking about, but like he talked about how writers, you know, basketball writers kind of just milled around the, the arena. They didn't tweet. They didn't do anything. You know, they wrote their pregame if they felt like it. And then they wrote their postgame and filed it whenever they wanted, you know, and it would come in at like midnight at that time. And so we would just be like reading and, you know, this RSS reader would deliver all these articles that really – was like pre Twitter, you know, it was, it was, the tweets were coming in article form and that's how we wrote our blurbs. But the blurb writing to get to the main kind of nugget here, the, the blurb writing 
allowed you to get fully immersed in the league. Like they talk about learning a language, getting fully immersed into the language, fully immersed into the league to where you knew which writer had which gripe with which player or which coach had which, you know, like all of the stuff we now know, um, you know, from tweets. That stuff was how you understood the texture of the league. And now doing that fast forward for like 20 years, you know, it's you just have like this carnal knowledge, like it's in the back of your head. You don't even have to go look for it as to what person thinks which thing, whether it's a coach, an owner, a GM, a writer, a player, their agent. You know, what's the the public saying? What's the basketball Twitter saying? What's fantasy Twitter saying? So, like, you got all these different buckets of info in your mind. So when you're doing this B-150 work in games played, let's do games played. Games played, like, the nature of that prediction is so important. <laughs> it is, like, the most important thing. I don't know, maybe not the, uh, it's important. And it's dicey, like, when you look at games played numbers for as many years as I have, you get a sense for how random it is. And then also it's not always random, you know, and then you've got to really look at the player themselves. Our injury histories is going off a little draft guide panda tangent here. So we made it a point to create something that I haven't seen anywhere. If I think there's like one place I've seen it and it's definitely not fantasy friendly. Um, we have like basically a database of all player injuries and those are available in the draft guide. And so like, you need to know the exact history of each player, how many injuries, where were the injuries? What were they like, you know, what's the medical reality, you know, speaking of all this medical stuff, like what's the medical reality behind each injury? You know, there's some sites and people on Twitter that specialize in that, but like, you crunch it all together and now you got to come up with a prediction that matches sort of the, um, the potential for outlier, but also you can't just be like, yeah, Chris stops. You're going to play 30 games this year, you know, or like whoever, you know, because that might be the case that, you know, that's, that's what they played the last two years or something, you know? And so you got to throw that all in a bucket and then, you know, there's a lot of the the um, the secret ingredients that I can't really give out. But like it is so crucial to know how available these players are going to be. And especially if you play head to head or playoff formats, you need to know when these players are going to be available. And so you got to kind of dive into the like, let's talk OKC. How many years do they want to tank? They might be on the, 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 the very tanky side of that range. You go to Detroit like. Let's look at like Dwayne Casey, like he's not a tanky kind of a guy, you know, like Jeremy Grant spent a lot of the late end of the last season on the bench. Like, is he going to be cool with a tanky sort of a season two years in a row, you know, and from a player development standpoint, from a career standpoint, what are these guys really signing up for? And you do that with 30 teams and each of them have all these different textures and you have all these different people and power brokers. And what are those power brokers leaning into as far as demands on everybody else? And then you that, that like spits out a number, you know, or it spits out a value or it spits out an idea. And that's where to me the, the precision of this year, being able to build in a lot of the automation tools that I wanted to build in. And they're just deeply proprietary in the sense that like, this isn't just like an Excel formula, you know, this is like, you know, I don't, maybe AI, you know, Aaron intelligence. I don't know. Like, it's just like, it's not, it's not as simple as making calculations, but to be able to build that stuff in and get these ranges of possibility into such a tight space, it allows me to like get that piece nailed down. And then I can have the conceptual time to just sort of sit and stare at the wall and be like, hmm, you know, what if this plays out this way? And sort of just go down that rabbit hole, spend an hour on a player in a given kind of construct of a situation. And that might affect 10 projections.
you know, that might affect 10 rankings. Right, because if one guy's missing games, that means other guys are seeing additional playing time. That has to be factored into their season-long averages. So my my job with this podcast in general is to try to simplify winning at fantasy basketball. The B-150 is like basically the opposite of that, at least creation of it. What this is a hard question, I know. I'm going I'm to hit you with a tough one. I'm going full, like, hot seat mode here. If you were going to try to to shepherd someone along, and this someone, uh, potentially a listener of this podcast, was like, look, Brew, I don't, I don't have 300 hours. What is, what's a way that I could maybe learn how to do something similar for games played just on a smaller scale? I, I know for me, uh, the smaller scale version is, Looking at history, that's one. Looking at the situation around a team is two. And then kind of figuring out what the... This is rolled up into history. History in how many games they played and then why did they miss one. And and just kind of taking that and, you know, your, your, your spread... I know I'm going to get into statistics a tiny bit here. Your confidence interval on your games played prediction isn't going to be as tight as yours you know when you do when you finish your how many hours of handicapping of a particular guy you're like i have a pretty tight window here he's going to be between x games and y games and my number might be wider than that but what what is your way is is it what i just said i guess is that kind of the, yeah, like the that quick wasn't version very uncomplicated what you just said. <laughs> but that's like this that's the simplest way to pare it down because if you miss one of those big two or three things you're steer- you're actually doing yourself a disservice. Yeah, well, that you okay. That last point might be the most important thing. Maybe not. I don't know. But like, basically, it's, <laughs> it's really an important, important point. Well, yeah. because I see a lot of bad, bad games played projection uh, projections out there, like the kind that are just completely blowing an entire rank set. And we it's can- because you know, honestly, you know why? It, you know why it happens? I don't know who out there goes back at the end of the season and looks at their old, old results. Like I bet, I bet a couple of the top guys do, but like, how do you know what, how do you know if it went well or not? You know, your projection set. Cause if you did that, I can tell you, and this is where I was looking at a lot of stuff and I'm like, I don't know how this is out there. Like, and this is why we have 60 or so guys that are real needle movers this year. You, you, you you know based on what you're seeing that like somebody didn't do the comparative analysis of what they've predicted or just looking back at those numbers it's like they're throwing darts and so with that you know you basically you know you're asking like kind of like what's a simplified approach yeah to doing it i think you could probably look at their last 3 years and just kind of ballpark it you know, yeah, and, okay, and and you might not be on the right side of good with that kind of a thing, but that would get you. But it's better than a, just handicapping a, on hope, because I think the alternative there is handicapping on hope. This is how much. This is how many games I hope this guy plays this year, which is how I think a lot of people end up building their lists. They're like, oh, I really hope that this guy I like plays seventy six out of eighty two games. But if you look at the numbers. A lot of it might say, oh, God, he's going to that like 72 is a best case scenario. And a lot of people don't want to think that way because it would steer them away from guys they'd otherwise like. I think that that mental side of it plays a big role. You have everybody has players they want to target. And a lot of times this type of stuff either gets completely swept under the rug or wildly overblown to support what the sort of a pre-existing... I mean, this happens so much in the political space. I don't want to go down that path at all because it'll just make me sad. <laughs> and that's not what this is for right now. But there's this sort of uh, inherent bias, and then you people might handicap to build into what they already want the answer to be. Well, I mean, yeah, I'm not touching any of that. <laughs> but, but I was just sitting here as you're talking. I probably rattled through in my head like 16 different, we'll call them pieces of data, but they're not really data driven, some of them. You know, 16 different things. Why is it 16? I don't know. Maybe it's because it's a multiple of two. Who knows? Yeah, it's a power. Um, you're you're, you're uh, dividing by two. You've been playing Price's Rights half off game 
in your spare is that time. What that is. That's a great, um, that's a great game. No, I, but then I was just like thinking about there's so many, you have to just stick the landing on the projection. Like, like there was Anthony Davis a few years back. I forget what year off the top of my head, but he had never played in over 70 games. And you're sitting there and you're looking at him and you're like, it's got to happen at some point. Like if you were to just straight line that projection, you'd end up with like 63 or something, you know? And so that, you know, you, you had to know, and we got that right that year, you know, it was like, look, you know, he's not getting any younger. Are we really going to bet that he doesn't eclipse 70 games once in his career? No, that seems like a bad bet, you know, and then I forget exactly what year it was and how it all lined up, but it was, it was just like, yeah, was that the one where they actually get... tried a little bit? Was it that year? Yeah. 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 It was like, you know, he's got to kind of like come around and, and stop taking some of these games off. So like, then you've got, obviously, you know, he was such a huge value and then we were out ahead of everybody with it. And then everybody got Anthony Davis and everybody was happy and we won. Um, so like you couldn't apply maybe 16 of those other rules. You couldn't have like a rules based approach. You know, you have to sit and stare at the wall. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> you have to sit <laughs> and, 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 or the stare at the stats and, and like have the time to just play out the different angles and the scenarios, which is what handicapping this last year really helped reinforce for me was that like angles are angles. It doesn't matter if they're data driven. In fact, in, in handicapping so much of the data driven stuff was BS. Yeah. Cause it's already, that's already been factored. It's already baked in. Yeah. They, they Vegas odds makers set a line based on splitting the money and power rankings and whatever data we think we've found that's in their power rankings already. It was, you know, and, and it was such a great relief to me to know that I could use my brain yep. and not have to be so knee deep in the numbers, even though the numbers can be extremely powerful, you know? So it's like, you got to, it's like everybody, everybody always says, it's like, you got to use the numbers when the, it's right to use the numbers and not use them when it's right to not use them. But being able to to really dial in and knowing I couldn't use my hands, really, you know, for most of this, I've, I've been doing a lot of dictation software. Um, as I've improved, I've been able to like peck at the keyboard and you know all these different things <laughs> like that the, I've been able to. You're like the chimpanzee out. that's like hanging over the computer typing. Dude, with I'm his like feet. typing with my nose. <laughs> 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 no, I mean, but when when that was the fear, right? Like that I could be, possibly be in that spot. Like I was like, well, I better build that stuff out that I was talking about building all those years. And I built it out and it ended up saving me a ton of time in the long run. And it's one of those things where it's like a risk. Like you don't know as you're building certain things out, like, will this actually work? Will this add value? You know, so I kind of felt like I got a little lucky in that regard that these particular things that I built out actually ended up having value. And then I, uh, was able to really just sit with projections and just, you know, play out all those angles. And um, it's good. It's good. So I'm, I'm happy about this release. It's always a great thing to get it off my um, shoulders because now it's sort of the second season is adjusting to everything that's going to come through the pipeline. And, um, you know, increasing confidence in certain takes, angles that I've seen where it's like I see the angle, but I also want to confirm it a little bit, you know. It's, it's, and you gotta have it that way. You can't, people will say, yeah, you gotta just like ignore the preseason. Like, no, 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 no. You, you, you have to ignore a lot of the preseason. Yeah. You have to know <laughs> which things to ignore. Yeah. It's, and it I mean, cause it happens every year. And, you know, for example, like Boston's coming out gangbusters talking about pace. Sounds like they're going to run a little bit more. Yeah, although they've been very murky on who their starting center is to this point. So other things to either ignore or not ignore. Mm, mm -hmm. What do you think? I, I don't think he's not going to start. I actually think Horford's starting. I think the old man's really getting in there. I don't care. I'll just put that out there. No, it probably doesn't change the minute distribution that much. Maybe a little, though. But that was that's a good point. I mean, did Horford sandbag and, and get ready for one last run? You know? I think he might have, and I, I'm just looking back at what Boston did last year. A lot of their issues were because the 
last line of defense was never in the right spot. That's that's the Horford motto. I'm in the right spot. That's like how he's made, that's how he's made all his money after he lost some of his athleticism. I'm in the right spot on defense. I'm not recovering from eight feet away, which you know, Time Lord able to block shots from eight feet away. That's pretty cool. But I think Boston would have preferred he's just like in the proper position on defense. That, that to me is why they might be going with the old man. Just stability. But we'll see. I'm I mean, a little higher on his positioning than you are. You are. Uh, you're higher uh, on Robert. Oh, on Robert. Ro- Sir, Sir Robert Williams III. Uh, his, is his it, majesty. Has it gotten better? Um, Probably. You know, that's actually, if, if, if we're getting into the sausage or whatever, like, th- there is a jump for big men at around, like, the two to three year mark that they get positioning figured out. Yeah, that, well, that needs to, and if it does, that's a, that's a game changer. He's, he's not, like, he's not Al Horford positioning level. But he's also on the other end, he's not Chris Boucher positioning level, which was <laughs> <laughs> like, and that dude's basically 30 already, so I don't know how much better it's getting. Uh, uh yeah. yeah yeah but like you know teams have to do a certain thing so anyway listen i want to talk about one other thing here besides the b150 quick note for those listening i hope you guys enjoyed like pulling back the curtain a little bit on how to handicap stuff like games played uh you can get the b150 now in the hoopball 360 plan you can get it in four days in the old school bundle, that's the uh, full season fantasy and the wagering subscriptions, or the fantasy pass, which is the biggest seller at Hoopball, that gets it on October the 9th. We have six minutes on our pod hit clock, and can I, I promise one. You can steal one, yes. I'll use five okay. on the late I second just, round. I just want to say like how much fun handicapping was. And and I want to say how relevant it was to fantasy. Like and I'm going to do it again this year because I thought that it added a ton of value to my fantasy analysis. Um, being in sort of ingrained in, in, in the storylines of each team on a day-to-day basis, especially if you do daily transactions in fantasy leagues, I just thought was like a, just like a, a force multiplier, you know, five, 10 times what you understood on a day-to-day basis, what a player is going for. If you play DFS, like, Talk to Dan, talk to, you know, Devin, talk to the guys about a deal you can get with my bookie that's pretty good. And just get in there for small dollar amounts, even. Like, and and that's where that 360 comes in. You can basically just win, you know, money by being plugged in. You could shadow the guys, myself included. And, you know, it's just a really smart way to understand the ebbs and flows of the game is mm-hmm. to have a little bit of money on that whatever night you know okay see and you watch it you watch Detroit. it you watch it more closely you always do you do it's it's i just it was a really fun you got to just keep your your mentality about it in a in a place where you're like you know this is just another wrinkle to what i do with basketball it's not like i got to bet 100 you know like i have 100 dollars and i got to bet all 100 on this game no <laughs> like <laughs> nor should you have a bankroll figure out what you're comfortable with you're, you're going to be like within that margin anyway, you know, some amount, like unless you just like go on a 65 percent heater like, um, you know, some, some of our guys have done in the past year. Yeah, Troy, uh, man, Troy had a hell of an NBA season. Um, yeah, so that's my I took a minute and a half, but like, yeah, that's, that's OK. I, just, I highly recommend it for anybody who watches basketball. I've resigned myself to the fact that we're not going to be able to do the late second round deep dive today that I, I was hoping maybe we would get to. So instead, I'm just going to hit you with more of a broad question, which is last week we talked about the weirdness of like most of the first round other than Jokic at the very top. The second round, it feels like things only get kind of murky the last three or four picks, like 21 through 24, and then even the first few picks of the third round. I know you haven't done, you're not a big Mox guy. This is time you spend working on the aforementioned B-150. What what do you do, forget even the second round. This becomes more of a draft strategy question. What do you do if you get to a point in a draft and the next guy you like is someone you feel like you could have easily just gotten like 15 picks later. Do you still take them in that spot, or do you go 
or do you retool on the fly? Because I think that's actually the weird mental thing that's happening to a lot of people here, which is like, well, these are guys I, I like, but I liked them at like 29, and here they are as my favorite guys still on the board at, at 20, or I liked them at 32, and I'm sure they would get back to me at my next pick. It's, it's a hard hurdle, I think, for people to jump that early in a draft. It feels like there should be a, an order to things, and I just don't know that there is. So you got two minutes. What do you do when that situation hits you on draft night, and you got 45 seconds to make a pick? I got 45 seconds to make an analysis right now. Um, I think <laughs> the second round is not as scary as a lot of people think it is. Um, number two... Um, you you have to have sort of two buckets in your head. And and it, as far as not being a mocks guy, I don't go participate in a lot of mocks like right now because I'm creating the B-150. I got my head down and getting that work done. Um, but I probably end up in like sort of like 50 some odd drafts, you know, before my final big ones. So I know where guys are going and you got to kind of understand the cadence of the draft. So like if it's a lot of guards early, we see that quite often. You know, you got to know that like those guards aren't coming back you know, after a certain point. So then you have your bucket of guards that are coming after that. So you then got to kind of just plot out where that value sits in the grand scheme of things. And then that's going to determine whether or not you make a play on the guy that's higher ranked versus possibly gambling. You know, you might go and say, all right, Hey, I like this guy. You know, he's like, you know, maybe three, four slots down, same ballpark, but you know, I, I, I know I got to take that guy now so I could possibly get the higher ranked guy in the next round because there's a chance he's coming back. The thing that the, the, the third ingredient of this is that if you take somebody with your first pick that's like, I don't know, Steph or somebody, you know, it's like three pointers or just like locked in. And now all of a sudden threes become less valuable to you in the grand scheme of things. And now one of these two players is a three point shooting player, you know, that's going to end up affecting your analysis. You know, maybe, maybe those two players combined are like, you're like, okay, I need those two. And then I can start to ignore three pointers. That's like eight different data points, nine different data points floating around your brain while you're making that next ADP driven decision. So I, I look at it as layers, like, ADP probably drives most of the discussion because I'm very much a, a like a best player available kind of a guy yeah. in a lot of situations. So ADP drives it, but then the tiebreakers are the things that, you know, you're looking at it. And it's like they're coming back, you know, it's like 13 slots is like ADP, you know, and say, say the, the player coming, the, the, the pick coming back to you is 13 slots from now, you know, and, and the player is expected to be available 13 slots from now. So it's kind of a 50, 50 coin, a, a coin toss as to whether you get that player or not. Now I'm going, all right, 50, 50. What do I think about those odds? What's the value gain here? What is the positional stats? You know, what, what's that look like? If that all happens in 45 seconds, it probably happens in 15. Cause honestly, I don't like picking with 15 seconds left on the clock. Picking with 15 seconds left on the clock is a recipe for disaster. Yeah, the heart starts to race. It's a whole damn thing. It mm. is. Oh, I got so many more things I want to ask you about this stuff. But we are out of time today. And next week, I believe, is going to be our super special Legends of Fantasy show on Friday. So folks might have to wait to get a little more draft strategy uh, until two weeks from now. Big dog, you got to run. Thank you, as always. Arf, arf. He is at Aaron Bruski, A-A-R-O-N-B-R-U-S-K-I. You guys knew that already. Go follow him now and check out the B-150. The big dog Aaron Bruski. We always leave needing to do more things. So here's the thing. Brew and I get on the phone, and we have like 45 to 50 minutes of time, and then we, ch then we waste 15 to 20 of it off air. We don't waste it. It's actually talking about things going on in hoop ball that actually require a ton of attention. But then we only have 25 to 30 minutes for the pod hit, and I get to the end, and I'm like, damn it. I spent the whole freaking time asking you about a thing that wasn't even on the docket. But I, I just thought picking his brain on games played, which is actually, that's a handicapping point that a lot of analysts disagree on. How do you come up with these numbers? I thought diving in with, frankly, the guy who's the best at it, and how I think I've become pretty good at that also is by following his work and logic 
would be kind of cool for you guys as well. So we'll try to talk about the second round at some point. I'll obviously get into it more on Twitter. Again, that's at Dan Bespris. You can follow Brew on social media at Aaron Brewski. Want to welcome back our buddies from Manscaped. It's October 1st. Manscaped is back with us, everybody. Took a little two-month hiatus. Don't blame them. That's the off-season. Not that many. I mean, like 30, 20% of you guys probably stick around in the off-season on this podcast. But now you're back, and so are they. Use promo code HOOPBALL20 to get 20% off and free shipping on your Manscaped order. They've got the Lawnmower 4.0. That's right, fourth generation lawnmower. They've also got other things like the Weed Whacker for ear and nose hair. But look, you guys want the lawnmower. That's a 7,000 RPM motor, a multifunction on off switch that can engage a travel lock. You can turn the 4,000K LED spotlight on and off when you're shaving. By the way, it's actually really nice to be able to turn that on and off. I have one of these, I use it. When you're using it on like near your neck, the light actually is so bright that it makes it hard to see the. Uh, the trim line. So you want to turn that off when you're doing something where you need to create a uh, like a really nice line. You want to use a light from farther away. But when you're looking for the grain of the hair, wanting to make sure that you got a particular area perfectly clean, the light is spectacular. I live in a very dark apartment. We got a southern exposure. So the sun only hits us for a few hours in the middle of the day. And Lord knows I'm not going to like go shave in the living room. That's dumb. Go get yourself a Lawnmower 4.0. The Performance Package 4.0 also includes a free pair of Manscaped anti-chafing boxer briefs. I want some of their boxers, man. I got to hit them up for that, too. Ah, it's good stuff. Ear and nose hair trimmer. That's good stuff, too. 20% off and free shipping with promo code HOOPBALL20. We got to move a handful of these units to keep Manscaped and their coupon code active all season long. So we need you to head over there. Manscaped.com. They've got all their silly taglines, but I'm just going to remind you again. Hoopball 20, 20% off, free shipping. Do it to it. I love that they, by the way, their tagline is Ben Simmons has 76 problems this season, but you can have none. (laughs) He does have problems this season. They're not wrong. All right, guys. Hope you enjoyed this Friday episode. Special weekend shows coming up in the month of October. We're going to try to go for 31 shows in 31 days this month, I believe, that our show tomorrow on Saturday is going to be with my good old buddy, Brandon Marcus. You guys remember him from Brandon Day. We had him on every Wednesday for a season doing buy lows and sell highs. Can't do that during the preseason, but we'll pick his brain a bit on some of the spots he's targeting and maybe even more so some of the spots he's avoiding. Again, that's coming up tomorrow. Uh, we will talk to Adam Stock shortly. We have round seven and eight of the mock draft to cover Holy macaroni. Uh, Mike Catron's coming up on the show soon. Jonas Nader early next week. Matt Lawson early next week. Alex Rickling early next week. We'll have a Brewski and Dr. A combo show next week. Josh Lloyd, Greg Ehrenberg, Mike Barner. Oh my goodness. Have I bit off too much? And reigning midweek downloads champion, Matt Smith. That's coming up early next week as well. I'm Dan Vespers. This is Fantasy NBA Today. Thanks again for listening, everybody. Please do bug me with whatever questions you might have. I'm here for you. Have a great Friday. We'll talk to you. Can you believe it? Not Monday. Tomorrow. So long. This has been a Hoop Bowl presentation.